I'm Fitz, and welcome to episode 21 of Knock Once for Yes. There is certainly no doubt that it's summer now with the long sunny days encouraging a lackadaisical approach to life, and a daily longing for the cool embrace of the clear starry night, which is apt, as this episode we visit a World War II RAF night fighter base. It's been very busy this month at Coffee HQ 2, not in the paranormal sense, but behind the scenes. If you follow us on social media, you may well know that we've now launched the brand spanking new Knock Once for Yes website. We're really proud of it, and not only that, it also features our new Knock Once for Yes merch store. We do hope you'll visit the website at knockonceforyes.com to check it out, let us know what you think, and maybe grab yourself an awesome Knock Once for Yes t-shirt. We know a few of you have already done so, and we've loved seeing the pictures, so please do keep them coming in. I know it's so strange to me seeing people around the world sporting our our Knock Once VS t-shirts, and also I need to get one myself! (laughs) I know you've already got one fits, but I don't have one yet, I feel so left out. (laughs) No, I had one of the trial ones, so mine's not even as good as the ones we've got (laughs) up in the store at the moment. Moving swiftly on, what have we got coming up on today's episode, Lil? Well, this episode has turned out to have a distinctly 1940s theme. We visited the Twinwood Airfield Glen Miller Museum with a wartime-themed paranormal radar story. Longtime listener and patron Andrew shares another of his paranormal experiences from Okinawa. Kirsty recounts her experiences at Hohn Barracks in Germany, which are adjacent to the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp and Erin gets her fingers burnt while contacting the other side. During the course of our research on Twinwood, we also came across paranormal investigator and author Adrian Perkins, who very kindly agreed to sit down with us and discuss some of his experiences. But before we get stuck into all of that, we want to give a massive shout out and thank you to our latest patrons. Carrie Palmer. Mr F. And Leslie Ostick, who's kindly upped her pledge again this month. It is thanks to all our patrons and coffee supporters that we can continue to do the show, so thank you from both of us for keeping the lights on round here. So, Lil, I understand you found an interesting paranormal radar story this month. I have. Now, this isn't a new news story, but it is a fascinating one. And it was just so in keeping with the theme of this episode's paranormal postcard adventure, I couldn't resist bringing it to the radar. In Scotland, around three miles south of a coastal town in Angus, is the former air station RAF Montrose. Despite closing its doors in the 50s after 40 years of service, in recent decades it's been reopened to the public as a heritage centre, preserving important historical buildings and artefacts and, of course, telling the story of the men and women who served there, many of whom lost their lives fighting for their country. In a place steeped in so much history, and with so many stories to tell, you would almost expect it to be haunted. But what the museum staff weren't quite expecting was for one of the historical artefacts to start telling its own story, in a very audible fashion. Staff say they're actually rather used to the ghosts at RAF Montrose, with phantom footsteps, disembodied, mumbled conversations, and even the apparition of a black Labrador being quite common. But even they were taken aback when a 70-year-old radio started picking up vintage broadcasts without being turned on. The Pi Valve Wireless forms part of a display recreating a 1940s era room. It's not connected to any electricity and has no power supply. Yet, several people have clearly heard it, emitting Glenn Miller music and speeches by Winston Churchill occurring at random and sometimes continuing for up to half an hour at a time. The mysterious broadcasts have left staff scratching their heads in wonder, and so many people have now heard it that even the most sceptical are finding it difficult to rationalise. Bob Sutherland, trustee and treasurer of the air station, was actually a wireless operator with the RAF. 
But he couldn't find a logical explanation when he heard the radio playing At Last by Glenn Miller. He asked the centre's resident radio expert and various technicians to look at it, but even having taken the back off the wireless, they reported having found nothing but dust and cobwebs and concluded if any attempt were made to turn it on, it would probably just explode. The idea that it might be picking up present-day broadcasts was discussed, but with no powerful transmitter in the area, it was deemed unlikely. And anyhow, what present-day station would be transmitting the speeches of Winston Churchill? The radio was purchased second-hand in 1962 by the father of one of the centre's volunteers, who was herself very sceptical of the reported phenomenon. She thought someone was simply playing a prank, until, one day, she heard it for herself. The faint strains of Glenn Miller emanating from the dead radio. Awesome find. I really enjoyed that story. It's amazing, isn't it? I was thrilled to find that. And uh, Lil was saying when she was researching this, there was so much more to the story as well that we're going to have to investigate it more. And I think that may well be an upcoming curious case for our patrons. Yes, if you're a patron, that is definitely not the last you'll be hearing about RAF Montrose. It turned out that that radio story was just the tip of the iceberg with regards to haunting at that air station. And it's not even the last time you're going to be hearing about Glenn Miller this episode. Indeed. Moving on now, we've got our first listener story, and this one comes to us from Erin. Throughout the years, my sister and I have worked out that we are both able to do automatic writing. The ability to use a writing instrument to allow a spirit to make contact via writing or scribbles. It isn't limited to writing, though. If we channel a spirit and hold on to an item, the item begins to move. This began many years ago, when, as a laugh, we tried a seance. Well, that ability has gone from strength to strength since that time. Given that it feels incredibly powerful and sometimes creepy, we rarely do it. On one occasion, my sister and I used a matchbox to make contact. We slipped out the little box that holds the matches and each put one finger inside the outer cardboard shell, the part with the strip you use to strike the match on the side. We made contact with the spirit, although we weren't able to have any actual dialogue, given it was just a matchbox. The box just moved about rather violently. It even forced our hands holding the box up and hit our poor dog on the top of his head. We decided we'd better let this one go. There was a really dark feeling about this particular spirit. So we put the matchbox back together and carried on about our day. About 20 minutes later, I went outside to have a cigarette, as at the time I still smoked. Without giving it a thought, I grabbed the same box of matches we'd just used and headed outside. I sat down, put the cigarette in my mouth, and struck a match. Instantly, I felt an overwhelming burning heat in my fingers, and the whole box of matches lit up. The pain was so sharp and sudden, out of instinct I threw the box across the patio. I gathered myself and checked my fingers. They were bright red and felt like I'd just burnt myself on a hot stove. Then I went over and looked at the matches. Inside the box, every single match was burnt out, except the one I'd just tried to light. That was still unused and lying on the ground. This incident scared me off for a very long time to try and make any contact at all. It was very, very unsettling. And thank you to Erin for sharing that story. It's certainly an interesting one. I've never heard of a matchbox being used like that before, and I'm not sure from the description how it was done, 
No, I'm interested in hearing more about the technique they were using to contact the spirits through these various items. That sounds pretty interesting. So if you want to get in touch and tell us a little bit more about those experiences, that would be great. But yeah, I can understand. That must have been very, very unsettling indeed. And I can understand why it would put you off trying to make contact. I mean, this isn't, I've never heard of a matchbox exploding into flames like that before. I can't really see how that's logically possible when the match she was striking wasn't burnt out, was the only one that wasn't burnt out. Yeah, something inside the matchbox has obviously triggered it. But... Yeah, but but what? I can't... I'm struggling to rationalise that at all. Um, but this certainly isn't the first time we've heard of objects in a paranormal environment spontaneously combusting. No, and if you go back to the instance that... Uh, Keith mm, had, That's what I was thinking yeah, of too. he was having Bibles and things set on fire in his house. Yeah, so Very so strange. things setting themselves on fire is not new, but this, the matches bursting into flame like that, yeah, that's a new one on me. Well, we're glad you came out of it okay, and I hope you weren't too badly burnt from that one. Yeah. I'm also quite interested in the automatic writing you were talking about. It's something I've heard about. Uh, but it's not something I've ever experienced anyone doing or seen for myself. No, I'm with you. It's something I've heard quite a lot about, but I've not come into contact with it, and it is really interesting. So, yeah, if you've got any stories about that, I'd be interested to hear more as well. Yes, please do. Well, we've got more stories coming up for you, and this next one is from Andrew. As an adult, I'm not sensitive to seeing and hearing what some may call the supernatural. I may be a little more in tune with feelings, but that's about it. However, based on this experience, I think I may have been more intuitive as a four-year-old, as most of us are. What better place to explore those abilities than as an Air Force brat on the Japanese island of Okinawa? Short history of the island. The battle for Okinawa was one of the bloodiest in the Pacific, with an estimated total of over 82,000 direct casualties on both sides. This was the last battle before the US dropped two atomic bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. In 1963, my father was a pilot in the Air Force during the Vietnam War, flying from Okinawa to Vietnam on a daily basis. We lived in base housing, but it was different from other base housing we'd lived in in the past in the US. The neighbourhood wasn't on the base, and the houses were spread apart because of the terrain of low hills and small mountains. We lived in the middle of an area that had had intense fighting during World War II, then only 18 years past. The battle was so large there was no way to clean up everything the battle left behind. Right behind our house, there were tunnels carved out of the hillsides that the Japanese army used for command and hiding from American forces. Of course, we checked them out. They were fascinating, spooky and dangerous, but that never stopped a group of inquisitive kids. One day while playing in the small stream behind our house, I noticed something sticking out of the water. It turned out to be a human jawbone, a forgotten soldier. Bones were not hard to find, neither was ammunition. One day, I found a live hand grenade and brought it home, walking along, dropping it to see if it would go off. Ah, the mind of a four-year-old. You can imagine the scene from there. No one got hurt, but I was freaked out when my mother called the military police. Add to all this, ancient tombs scattered throughout the valley, and you can imagine, for a little boy and his friends, this was an amazing place to explore. We found creepy stuff pretty much every day. So on to my experience. We'd moved into our second home in base housing, it was situated up higher in the hills, with low mountains on both sides behind the home. 
This part of the world is known for significant monsoon seasons, raining so hard the muddy hills would often collapse. Late one night, we all felt the ground shudder during more monsoon rain. With the dark and the rain, there was no safe way to check it out. In the morning light, I could see through my window that one of the hillsides a couple of hundred yards away had collapsed, but I could not make anything else out. My brother and I headed out to see the damage. Even 18 years after the battle, nothing much grew on these hills, just some small plants and lots of sticky mud. As we got closer, we slowed down. We tried to comprehend what was in front of us. Half of the hundred foot hill had collapsed, revealing several caves. Following the mud down the slope, we saw thousands of bones, many coming out of large broken jars. Inside the dark caves, you could see more bones and hundreds of jars. It was a nightmare laid out before us. Evidently, the entrances of the caves had been covered up long ago. We didn't know at the time that the Okinawans had buried their dead that way, and I assume some of the bones were from Japanese soldiers lost in the battle. Beyond that day, I don't remember much about the cleanup. I assume there was one, but what we saw had shaken us up enough not to want to know. Not long after the hill collapsed, on a quiet, clear night, I was asleep on the upper level of my bunk bed with my brother in the lower bunk. I awoke to bright flashes and explosions, lighting up the bedroom. I lay on my side, watching the light show through the rectangular window. I remember white and red light and ear-shattering sounds, the window glass shaking, was constant and intense. There was a war going on right outside my window. I wasn't scared really, just in shock from what was happening. Looking back, I seemed to be in a type of trance. I listened in awe as the sounds of the explosions rocked the house. Being so young, I didn't understand what was going on, but who would? I climbed down from the bunk bed and found that my brother was still asleep. I didn't wake him. Moving down the hallway to my parents' room, the light from the explosions casting strange shadows all along the walls, I noticed no one else was up. My sister was also sound asleep. I was the only one experiencing the battle raging outside. Oddly, This didn't seem to bother me. I was a weird kid. Even as young as I was, I knew that what I was seeing and hearing was not happening now, but had happened in the past, and it could not hurt me. It was 1963. The war was long over. It seemed like this was a special gift just for me. I walked past the kitchen the light and the immense thudding sound of the explosions following me. Even with this extreme situation going on around me, I started to feel sleepy. I headed back to my bedroom, climbed back into the bunk bed, closed my eyes and drifted off to sleep with the explosions still echoing in my ears. To this day, I clearly remember the events of that night. It's nice to finally write them down. The next morning, I spoke to my mother about what had happened. She didn't discount what I had to say. I got the feeling she had had similar experiences, but she didn't say. I always thought my mother had intuitive abilities, but back then people didn't talk about things like that. I would caution adults to listen to their young children. You may not be able to see and hear something, but kids still have a connection that we as adults too soon lose. 
So was this a time slip? Or does the battle replay over every night only for those that are lucky or unlucky enough to see it? Wow, Andrew, what an incredible story. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And it must have made such a deep impression as a young child because I can't remember very much from when I was four years old. So to recount something that clearly from that age, it must have made a big impression, as it would, as you'd expect from something like that. Yeah, definitely. I must admit my memory is a bit weird. It only really starts when I was about seven, I think. I've got yeah. a couple of flashes before that, but mine's bizarre in that respect. You've got some years missing, haven't you? But that's not normal. <laughs> Weirdo. <laughs> yeah, but I that story there was so much to unpack there. I mean, was the was it caused by the collapse and the disturbing of the graves, or does it just replay at certain periods? Or? Well, and we don't know often with these things whether there's just like this perfect storm, excuse the pun, of like environmental factors with monsoons and possibly thundery weather. We, we just have no idea how those kind of environmental factors play into sus- you know, possibly something like the stone tape theory. Yeah. But as you say, yeah, the fact that the hill had collapsed and all those graves had been exposed quite recently by the sound of it, I would think plays into it somehow. Yeah, was it to do with the house? Like if he went outside, would he still see it? Or was it just because he was inside? Or just because he was young enough to still be open to yeah. those experiences. I mean... With all that noise going on, ordinarily, the rest of the household would have awoken. So it does seem like only something he could see and hear. But we hear this so often. I mean, he, you know, Andrew, you say yourself, young children are just do seem to be naturally more open to be able to experience these things. It's definitely a common theme, isn't it? And one of the things I absolutely love the most about when you hear these childhood experiences is the matter-of-factness of these children that have experienced them. It's like Andrew was saying, he wasn't scared, because at that age, kids don't know that there's anything weird about it. They're, you know, they're open-minded enough to not think, well, this shouldn't be happening. <laughs> and like, you hear that so often, you know, children recount stories of wise granddad sitting over there and things like this, and they're so down-to-earth about it because they don't know it shouldn't be happening, and I love that. Yeah, I must admit, if I heard a battle raging outside, I'd be looking out the windows and waking you up if you weren't already awake to the sounds of battle going on. But I just love the fact that kids that age, they just don't think it's weird, and I think that's amazing. Interestingly, that actually ties in quite well with our next story, where Kirsty shares her childhood ghost stories when she was living in Germany. My dad was in the army and we moved to Germany when I was only four. But it's surprising what you can remember at such a young age. Quite a lot happened in the four and a half years that we lived there, so bear with me. We lived on Hohn Barracks, which backed on to Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. Our home was a block of flats that originally housed SS troops during World War II and was later converted to a hospital block to help Jews that were kept in the concentration camp. When we moved into our flat, we were told by the other people who lived in the block that it was haunted, and the spirits that were in the block didn't like certain things. The three main spirits I can recall are the one in the attic that would wreak havoc if the attic was ever cleaned, making it messier than it was before. The one in a downstairs flat that would continually pull the plug out of the wall when people tried to hoover. And the one that enjoyed pushing people down the central flight of stairs. I always had a feeling of being watched when I was on the staircase. Next, there was the cellar. There were six flats in the block but only four accessible cellar storage areas. The other two had been bricked up. Years later, it was suggested that the cellar was used as a prison at the end of the war, and that a couple of SS soldiers were bricked up alive. How true that is, I don't know. But there was one time I remember when I was about eight, and my dad said I could go and get my bike to take outside as I always did, because of the feeling of being watched, I ran down the stairs to the cellar 
and went to get my bike. The cellar doors didn't have locks on them, just a latch similar to a garden gate. I opened the door and went inside. The ceiling light was dim and had always flickered, but it was enough to see what you were doing. I'd only been in there about a minute when the door closed behind me. I tried to open it, but couldn't. It felt locked. The latch wouldn't lift. Then the light went out. No more flickering. I remember everything going cold. I was only young and panicked when I couldn't get the door open, so I started shouting. Then all of a sudden, the light came back on, door latch clicked and opened. Needless to say, I never went down there by myself again. Dad always had to come with me. There are two more encounters that I remember so clearly. I'll save the scariest for last. I was about four and had been asleep in bed for quite a while when I heard somebody speaking a strange language. Quietly, like a whisper, but close enough to me that it woke me up. I then felt someone sit down on the end of my bed. At first, I thought it was my dad, but it wasn't. I remember sitting up and saying, Daddy, is that you? To which the answer I got back was no. My mum must have heard me talking, because she came in and asked if everything was okay. I told her who I was talking to. I didn't know his name, but I could describe him. He was a tall, old man with a grey beard. He was skinny, and wearing a brown coat and a funny-shaped hat, and he had a yellow star-shaped badge on his chest. I didn't know anything about the Jews or the Holocaust at the age of four, nor did I know that Jews were kept in the concentration camp and in our building when they were rescued. But Mum was adamant that I was describing a Jewish man. As for my final encounter, this one sends shivers down my spine every time I remember it. I hated my bedroom in this flat. It never felt right. I used to wake up crying in the middle of the night for no reason. Mum tried moving my bed around, but that just made things worse. When my bed was against one wall, and if I was lying on my stomach, I would feel someone walking up and down my back or jumping on the end of my bed. If my bed was against the other wall, I would find myself with a pillow being held down over my face, or the quilt would be randomly pulled off me in the middle of the night. Needless to say, these things scared me, and whenever my dad was on duty late, I would sleep in my mum's bed. Dad came home late one night and got into my bed to save disturbing me and mum. I'm just going to say that we had a big, burly German shepherd, scared of nothing until this night. Dad had just fallen asleep when I woke up to the sound of our dog growling and my dad coughing. The dog had never growled like that before. Then all of a sudden, my dad shouted and the dog barked. When dad came into mum's bedroom and woke my mum up, He said that someone had been smothering him with a pillow and that he couldn't breathe. He shouted, the dog barked and he kicked out at thin air in his confusion. After that night, I never had any problems in my bedroom again. But we did, however, end up with a shadow that would pace up and down the hallway outside my room, which was also opposite the living room. The shadow could be seen out of the corner of your eye most nights and the dog would regularly look up towards the door and growl at what would appear to be nothing. There are more stories, but these are the best. I hope you enjoy them and if you're looking for somewhere to investigate, I highly recommend Hone and Bergen Belsen.
Thank you, Kirsty, for sharing those stories. I know we say this a lot, but just wow. I'm not surprised bearing in mind what happened to the location. It's effectively seen the worst that humanity has to offer, that so much of what you experienced was negative. It certainly seems that periods of extreme stress or warfare do seem to increase the chances of there being paranormal activity somewhere. To be honest, I think given the location, I'd be surprised if there wasn't any paranormal activity going on there. But yeah, some of that was truly terrifying. I mean, waking up being smothered like that is just awful. Though what I found interesting was that after her dad had that experience of being smothered, it didn't happen to her again. But they did then have a figure pacing outside of her room. It's almost like her dad being in there surprised this entity and sort of it moved it out of the room then. Yeah, it's weird. I don't really know what to make of that. No. Although it's interesting that the dog seemed to be able to see it as well. That seems yeah. to be a common thread that animals can, can see or experience these things too. That's what they say, isn't it? Animals and children are so much more sensitive to it than us adults. Um, and the other thing, of course, I was going to say was at uh, four years old, as she said herself, she couldn't possibly have known about the history of Jews being being forced to wear a yellow star. I don't know. I mean, it's it's one of those places, like, the, the Germans kind of make a point of making their children study this sort of thing, and it wouldn't surprise me if there were plaques and information boards around sort of explaining it. But as but a it, four-year-old, how much of that would you really understand or absorb? Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily expect a four-year-old to sort of take it in. And as her mum seemed to express, that was quite a detailed description with the beard and the funny-shaped hat, as well as the star on the chest. I just think it's too much of a coincidence. Oh, yeah. You know, I think from what she was saying in the story, she's obviously experienced something, and it, it would seem to be somebody that was quite likely at Bergen Bells. Yeah, and that, not, not a negative experience, whereas the other ones were. Oh, and the other thing was, I completely empathise about being locked in the basement with a light off. I think we probably talked about this when, on our Halloween episode when we yeah. were discussing our old house. But so, as you may remember, one of my first experiences there was being locked in the basement and the lights going out on me. And I know you said that you, as a, as a young child, you panicked. Well, it happened to me as an adult <laughs> and I panicked. Just as much, let me assure you. I was going to say, imagine that happening to you when you were four. Oh, I, I can't. Like I said, as an adult, I literally screamed the house down. Everybody came running. <laughs> I'm glad you managed to come out the other side okay. And I do have to apologise if I did pronounce any of the German names incorrectly. I tried my best, so sorry. So thank you so much to everyone that sent in stories for this episode. If you've got a story that you'd like to share with us, please do just visit our website at knockonceviest.com. And now it's time to get into our latest paranormal postcard. And we've got quite a lot to bring you this time, because as well as our own reporting experiences, we have an interview with Adrian Perkins, an author who has written about and investigated this particular site extensively. This postcard has actually been quite a long time coming. Whilst looking for new locations to visit last year, I was thrilled to discover that there was a Glenn Miller and 1940s aviation museum just down the road from us. The catch was they only opened between May and September, so being the winter months at the time, I had to wait quite patiently for them to open for the new season. But it was certainly worth the wait. Now, if you've heard the name Twinwoods before, it may be because of the incredibly popular vintage music, dance and fashion festival they hold there every August in the outdoor arena. The event almost always sells out. And as the historic site fills with festival goers dressed in vintage outfits who dance and twirl to the sounds of swing, jazz and rock and roll, Twinwood must absolutely come alive with the spirit of the past. But we weren't going for the headline act of the festival. We were going to see the hidden gem that is the museum, tucked away in the original airfield huts dotted through the wooded site. It felt like a marvellous secret, and it turned out to be one of the most special places we've visited so far. When Lil suggested we visit the Air Museum at Twinwoods, I must admit that I got a little excited. 
I've loved aviation from a young age, and for me, the era of props and pistons is much more interesting than modern jets. On top of this, the uplifting big band sound of the Glenn Miller Orchestra can often be found spilling from the open windows of the coffee mobile, and this XREF station, previously home to night fighter squadrons of Blenheims, Bowfighters, Beauforts, Havocs and Mosquitoes, was also the place where Glenn Miller took off in his small UC-64, heading for Paris to make arrangements for the rest of his band to join him. Sadly, he never made it to Paris. At some point during his crossing of the Channel, the plane went down, and it's suspected that this was due to a faulty carburetor that was a known fault on this type of aircraft. Miller, along with pilot John Morgan and Lieutenant Colonel Norman Basil, were never seen again. Of course, Twinwoods is not just known for its ties to Glenn Miller and the Air Museum. It's also known to be haunted. On a beautiful, calm, sunny June day, we loaded up the coffee mobile and, joined by Lil's intrepid mum, we set out for Bedfordshire. Luckily, it's quite a short drive for us, and after only about 30 minutes, we were turning up a farm drive and bouncing along what would once have been the perimeter track of the airfield. The runways themselves are no longer there, having been dug up to reinstate the land as a farm. However, they are still visible from the air as a slight discoloration in the crops now growing there, themselves a ghost of the Second World War. We'd bounced along the track for some time, long enough in fact that I was beginning to wonder if I'd made a wrong turn at some point, and a chap with a Land Rover and shotgun was going to appear and politely ask us to leave when we rounded a corner and had reached our destination. The Union flag, RAF ensign, and the stars and stripes fluttering gently in the light wind stand as a memorial to the men and women who served there. Next to this stands the old control tower, utilitarian but resplendent in a fresh coat of dark green paint, and a large shed with a Second World War era truck inside. I must admit that at first impression I thought that this was all there was to the site and that we would be in and out within a few minutes. Fortunately, I was very wrong on this point as the site stretches on and back down a wooded path with various huts and buildings, each containing their own slice of history. There was so much, in fact, that it was nigh on closing time when we'd encompassed it all, or so we thought. At one point, we lost Lil's intrepid mother for a few minutes, and after we were buckling up ready to leave, she said, What did you think of the bunker at the end? Lil and I were puzzled by this, but it would appear that we'd completely missed yet another exhibit. Of course, we knew then that we would have to return at another time to see it, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Crunching across the gravel drive, we approached the entrance to the control tower, paid the very reasonable entrance fee, and made our way into the museum. We decided to begin on the top floor and started up the stairs. It was only seconds into our climb that Lil began to feel something. That very familiar change of atmosphere, an underwater feeling, slight electricity in the air like a brewing thunderstorm the signal that always sets her spidey senses tingling. Sadly, I didn't feel anything paranormal myself in the control tower, though standing in the main control room, looking up over the field that was once the runway, it's easy to imagine the tension of waiting, ears attuned to the sound of distant aero engines for all of your fellow servicemen to return from a mission. The top floor is set out much as it would have been in wartime, with a large blackboard denoting pilots, missions and the like. There's a room with radios and other bulky valve-driven electronics that would most likely now fit in the palm of your hand. Some mannequins sit or stand silently at their posts in uniform, 
maps to note operations in progress or in plan, and stacks of papers next to old typewriters that some staff have heard clacking away in earnest, even though no one else was present. The ground floor is dedicated to Glenn Miller and his orchestra. There are rows and rows of pictures, paintings and memorabilia, as well as an old jukebox loaded with the band's music. As I walked down the stairs, perhaps the most well-known song, In the Mood, was playing. The song complemented the pictures and atmosphere very well indeed. Though they were all taken in a very difficult period in history, in every picture, almost every person was smiling. Even I, heavy set and with two left feet, felt the urge to give Lil a twirl around the room. And it was here, amongst the smiling faces of people far from home, some never to return, that we had our first paranormal experience. I say we, it was in fact Lil's mum that suddenly jumped in place. She'd felt something touch her head, something inexplicably like fingers in her hair. More than that, When she instinctively reached up to brush whatever it was away, the back of her hand touched what felt for all the world like another hand just pulling away. This caused some rather manic whirling around and, after finding no reasonable cause, the room was fairly swiftly exited. This was to set the tone for the rest of the day as one or another or all of us were to have some kind of experience during our visit. At the rear of the control tower is the officer's mess. A long wooden bar runs almost the length of the room, with the remainder being a large open area that can be set for seating, socialising or dancing as required. We've talked before about places that seem to have an atmosphere about them, and this room has it in spades. Even though the room was empty and silent, there was an energy to it. If you've ever been in a noisy pub or bar, you'll know the feeling of being surrounded by a wall of animated conversation, and this was the feeling here. I wouldn't have been surprised to blink and find myself in the company in a group of officers sharing stories of their exploits. The feeling was similar to my experience at Green, though, but where there it felt as if there was a household waiting for us to leave to continue with their own business. Here it simply felt as if I was entirely unnoticed, a fly on the wall so to speak, surrounded by friendly banter and yet not quite able to fully perceive it. From the mess, there is a short walk to the next cluster of buildings and we went first to the Motor Transport Museum which also includes an Axis Forces area to the rear. Both Lil and I were to have experiences here. The three of us were the only ones present in the building at the time, and I was walking around with our video camera documenting our visit. Down the centre of the building were some trucks and trailers, and the outer edges of the room held display cabinets, with various uniforms, models, recovered machinery, and much, much more. I had just about completed my first lap of the building filming, when between two of the trucks, I saw a woman standing and looking into one of the displays. She appeared to me to be wearing a summer dress in a 40s pattern, with her hair up in a style that I would also, in my limited knowledge of historical ladies' hairstyles, place as around the 1940s. My initial thought was that some of the staff might dress in a period style, and I continued around the back of the truck filming. Literally seconds after seeing her, I found that there was no one there. There was not enough time for her to have left through the front of the building, even at a sprint, and she'd not passed Lil in the rear of the building to be able to get out of the back door. I didn't have any kind of unusual feeling when I saw her, and when I later reviewed the recording, she was nowhere to be seen. I didn't have long to try and make sense of what I'd seen, as Lil quickly came up to me and dragged me back to one of the Axis displays. 
In the display was what appeared to be a metallic banner head of an eagle with spread wings, holding a wreath which contained a swastika, which I presume you're all familiar with as being a symbol of the Nazi party. I'll admit to feeling a slight uneasiness from it, but I cannot be sure if it was simply from being in such close proximity to an object associated with such a terrible movement in our history, or whether it was more unnatural. Lil, however, was much clearer in her feeling, recognising the immediate recoiling and a wave of nausea as the same reaction she had to the jar of earth in the Haunted Antiques Paranormal Research Centre. It must be said that the overall experience was not helped by the light in the display case strobing with a stuttering flicker that lent the whole scene a horror movie effect. So far, we've visited only two buildings, and all three of us have had some kind of experience. I'm sure that this place would be an excellent one to carry out an investigation, and should the opportunity arise, I'll jump at the chance. We're not done yet though, so we move on to the Aviation Museum. For a fan of World War II aviation, this building is a treasure trove. I'm surrounded by pieces of aircraft, in some cases quite large, such as a pair of Merlin engines recovered from a downed aircraft, representing the USA, and Allison recovered from yet another wreck. There were turrets, oil filters, superchargers, allied and axis, each labelled with as much of the history as was known to the museum. Perhaps my geekery blinded my perception of anything paranormal, but Lil quickly approached me and suggested I stand in a certain corner, as while she had been standing there, she had experienced a sudden acrid burning smell that seemed confined solely to this spot in the room, and just as suddenly vanished. I stood where she suggested, and looked over the display that was there. It was centred around an engine part from a P-38 Lightning, but I failed to detect any sense of smoke or burning. We searched around though for anything that could be emitting the smell, electronics, air vents or even something coming in from the doorway, but there was nothing. Later, we found out that in this room Lil's mum had once again felt something, or someone, touch her hair but being so unused to experiencing the paranormal for herself, she started to doubt her own experiences and didn't talk about it until the ride home. At this stage, we decided that it was time for refreshments, so we popped into the nearby Naffy for a coffee. We were very warmly welcomed by the staff, all clearly very proud of the museum and the work that had gone into turning the previously run-down wartime sheds into the museum that we were enjoying. In fact, after we'd finished our coffees, we were given a personal guided tour of the Homefront Museum by one of the staff. The Homefront Museum is made up of various types of room being made to appear as they would have during the war, from a simple average living room, to an operations room, a toy shop, and it even includes a small street scene with a simulated nighttime air raid. They're all very well done. Think Disney does World War II on a very limited budget. I again failed to have any kind of paranormal experience here, but the sense of history was palpable in itself. From here, we paid a short visit to the Summer of 44 Museum, which was undergoing redecoration. It's currently laid out as a barrack room, which it once was, and was also used during the filming of First Light, itself based on the book of the same name, of the memoirs of Geoffrey Wellham, who was a fighter pilot in the Second World War. I've read the book myself and can highly recommend it. We made a very brief visit to the smaller First World War hut, only to be chased from the building by a hornet. Our last stop before heading out was the Under Fire Museum, which is dedicated to the wartime fire service and is presented as an accurate representation of a utility fire station from the 1940s. At this point, we were very close to the closing time of the museum, so as Lil and her mum stopped to pick up some souvenirs, 
I headed back to the coffee mobile to load up. It isn't unusual for either of them to take some time when shopping, so a little time passed before I began to wonder if I should perhaps head back to investigate. However, the gentle flapping of the flags in the wind, the gentle warmth of the summer afternoon, and the comfort of a soft seat after a day on my feet lulled me into relaxation. I mean, if there was a problem, one or other of them would have called, or at this distance just a loud shout would have done. It turns out that maybe I should have returned to investigate, as Lil and her mum were being completely unbidden, regaled with tales of all the paranormal experiences of the staff. Lil didn't wish to break the spell, as it were, to summon me back, and so I had only their second-hand recounting of this for our journey home. It was the most amazing thing, because although we'd talked to the volunteers quite a bit earlier, we hadn't brought up ghosts at any point during our visit to them. Sometimes I like to visit places without too much background knowledge, so that my impressions aren't coloured by expectation. And that can actually make the later research much more fun, especially if you end up discovering things that tie into your own experiences. And on this occasion, that turned out to be a really good call because that's exactly what happened. My mum and I were just browsing the souvenirs for a keepsake when the volunteers started talking about the resident-friendly ghosts of Twinwood. It was so organic, so unbidden, and obviously such a natural thing for them to talk about between themselves. We were just spellbound. It was wonderful. And they've experienced a plethora of things, from phantom sounds and smells and whispered conversations to full-bodied apparitions, doors opening and closing by themselves, some doors that were only opened by direct verbal request. The list just went on and on, and when we told them about our own experiences during our short time there, they weren't at all surprised. In fact, it seemed that we weren't the first people to have had those specific encounters. The main thing that came across, though, was the deep connection the staff have for the place. They've poured their hearts and souls into creating this museum. Most of the displays are either their own personal collections of memorabilia and artefacts, or they've recovered the artefacts themselves from archaeological digs of local crash sites. They seem completely in tune with their ghosts, and accept that they are just a part of Twinwoods as much as they themselves are. They've never found anything negative here, and simply want to coexist peacefully with the spirits there. And I must say at this point, I think that we all felt the same about the very peaceful atmosphere of the place. With the tiny exception of that one artefact that seemed to have absorbed more than its fair share of negative energy, Twinwoods to me felt light and airy. But just a little bit like time couldn't quite make up its mind which era it wanted to be in at any given time. The other thing that the volunteers expressed was that they're very fond of Adrian Perkins, the paranormal investigator and author, also known as the ghost detective, that we'd come across while researching the site. He was kind enough to grant us some of his time to discuss his experiences the weekend after our visit to Twinwood, and interestingly, also corroborate some of our own. We had a wonderful afternoon speaking to Adrian, and I think the total runtime of the interview, and this wasn't just us chatting, the actual interview ran out to over two hours. It was just one of those we never wanted to end. Poor Adrian couldn't get us out of his house. It was so interesting talking to him. We tried so hard to keep it to just Twinwoods, but we did inevitably end up going a bit off topic and down a few rabbit holes at points. What we've done, we've edited it down to purely twin woods for this episode but what we'll do is for our patrons we'll release the full interview as a patron only special it does run for about an hour and a half and it's perhaps twice as long as this one and it will feature what is in this interview as well so if you are a patron and you don't want to have to listen to things twice then stop now <laughs> pop yourself off to patreon and have a listen if you want to hear all our strange ramblings and going down a few rabbit holes, then check that out. But for everyone else, here's our interview with Adrian. 
Okay, we're here today with Adrian Perkins, who is a paranormal investigator and author of the Ghost Detective series of books. Thank you very much for agreeing to speak to us today. Good to see you. To start off with, because our listeners might not have heard of you, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you do and your books? Yeah, um, so I've been investigating uh, paranormal for 25 years now. And uh, I go to locations and well, I'm asked to go to quite a few locations and I take a team of people with me, archaeologists, historians, parapsychologists, and we will go in and we will evaluate all the situation that we come across. And from then we'll say, is it worth investigating? If it's worth investigating, we'll probably take up to two to three years investigating that place. And um, it's it's gone from strength to strength. And I'm on book seven now of the Ghost Detective series, and uh, it's something that I absolutely love doing. So where did the term ghost detective come from? Um, I, I gave myself that sort of name, if you like, uh, because it's what I do. I, I, I go in and I investigate uh, ghosts. I think... From a long way back, really, when I was six years old, I saw the first, my first ghost. Ah, well, in actual fact, that's something we always ask every guest that we have on our show is, how did you get into the paranormal in the first place? So perhaps we'll get right into that question now. Yes, um, I was living in a village called Whedon in Northamptonshire. Um, I was six years old, it was 1963, and uh, laying in bed, winter's night, watching the car headlights sweep round my bedroom. That My bedroom was right at the front of the house near the road. And uh, I just liked watching the shapes that they made, the car headlights made. And I noticed the door to the bedroom opened. And the door had a squeak, but it didn't open with a squeak. Oh. So it was very strange. And then this black shape walked in. Uh, it was in the shape of a person, quite large. And it walked straight towards the bed. At that point, the blankets went over the top of my head. (laughs) A little peak (laughs) hole was left. And I thought, I don't like this. No, I don't blame you. And the shape walked right up to the bed. It turned to face away and it sat down on the bed. At that point, because I was only little, I rolled towards it because the depression it made oh. in the mattress made me roll towards it. Oh, goodness. But I couldn't feel anything. I, I, just sent, I just rolled towards what I thought was the edge of the bed. And um, I was trying to control my breathing mm. because I didn't want to let it know I was there. I yeah. thought, um, how you feel safe under blankets is unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. But I did. And I was looking at this object and it leant forward. It put its head in its hands with elbows on the knees as if in a distressed state. And then a car went by outside and I could see the wallpaper and the picture rail through what was sitting on the bed. And from that moment on, it's just, I never told anybody about this for nearly, it must have been, what, I was six years old, it must have been 35 years afterwards before I told anybody about that. You say you didn't talk about it for years. Mm. What made you suddenly start writing books and investigating? Uh, Well, I actually started writing children's books. Um, I did like a mystery trilogy, Mm -hmm. which was awful. (laughs) (laughs) I must admit, I was learning my trade. I I decided to write the children's trilogy to see if I could actually do it. Mm, Yeah. And I enjoyed it. And a friend of mine said, hang on you really are into ghosts and spirits. He knew me really well. We've been lifelong <laughs> friends. Why don't you do something about that? Well, at the time, as I've said before to you, I've, I, I collect books mm. and I love true ghost stories oh, and I've collected them from all over the place. Yep. And the trouble I found was I was getting the same stories. Yeah. Volley Rectory oh, cropped yeah, I, up yeah. so many times. <laughs> but As you, a fellow you did, collector of yeah, those books, I completely you can understand. understand. <laughs> yeah. You get a, a range of 13, 14 stories in the book yeah. and, you know, five, the six of them the same. And I got fed up with it. So I thought, I said to the wife, I said, I'm going to go on a quest and I'm going to go on the radio and I'm going to ask for people's stories. Mm-hmm. 
which I did. I went on to BBC Radio Northampton. Mm. And uh, I, I ended up uh, going to well over 50, 60 people Thank and you. interviewing them for their ghost stories. And um, we ended up with Australia, South Africa, uh, the UK, and all around the UK. But from there, it sort of, it wasn't enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I just needed more. I, I knew I was getting these uh, ghost stories, but I needed to find out the mechanics behind how yeah. these things were working. Mm. Sure. And that's when I went over to a certain place to do Twin a real Woods. good investigation. So how did you even find out about Twin Woods? Um, I was sitting in my living room uh, one evening and the phone rang. And the chap on the other side said, this is going to be really bizarre. <laughs> I said, go for it. You know, go for <laughs> it. And he said, I'm an archaeologist and I work up at Twinwoods, RAF Twinwoods. Never heard of the place. I'd never heard of it. I'm, I'm not into the Second World War aircraft or anything. And he said, I work up there and we're renovating the buildings to do uh, an aviation recovery museum to have it based there. And then he started telling me about Twinwoods. And um, he said it was the place where Glenn Miller last took off from, December 1944, took off from there, then to be, to be seen again. And the conversation was so intriguing. And we agreed to meet over at Twinwoods. I'd never been there before in my life. And I knew from what he said, there was quite a few people he wanted me to meet. And I drove over there, and it was a lovely sunny day, and it was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Mine looked like the only car there, and I thought, have I got the right day? <laughs> <laughs> and I parked the car up, and I got out. I was standing by the control tower. You could see all these old buildings in a derelict state, mm-hmm. apart from the control tower. That was already done. And unawares that they'd got a PA system running through the forest. All of a sudden, I got moonlight serenade from Glenn Miller <laughs> coming out of this forest, and the hairs on the back of my neck just stood up. I bet. And from that moment on, I fell in love with the place. Yeah. I absolutely fell in love with the place. And then we went into investigation mode, and I interviewed about 16 people. Wow. Each one had a different story to tell of Twinwoods. That's a lot of people. A lot of people. The, the, I was spent a long time there. I think it was dark when I left. But <laughs> the, the people um, with the experiences were so genuine. Robert Allen, the chap who runs the Aviation Recovery Museum there, was so genuine. Um, he showed me engines with stories. Everything he, he has up there has a story to it. Mm. And this one particular engine, he said, This is why I do what I do. And he said, take a look at the engine. And to me, it's a thing with a propeller on the front. That's it. I know the thing at the back drives the propeller. It goes up in the air. He said, no, look closely behind the propeller. And there was a parachute entangled behind the propeller. When the plane went in, it took somebody out on the way down. Oh, goodness. That was what sparks him. Mm Mm-hmm. And it sparked me with the story. And I said to him, um, I've got to do something. It's a very long story, and I'm going to try and compact it down for you. Um, They had things happening. And we said from Collecting Ghost Stories, shall we do a vigil, an overnight vigil? At that point, there was no electricity. Oh, okay. And if you wanted um, a drink, you took a flask. Yeah. That's how derelict it was. Yeah. And we did the first vigil, and it was minus five. Oof. Oof. We, when you, we went from about uh, eight o'clock at night till four o'clock in the morning. Oh, mm-hmm. but you were freezing. It was painful, <laughs> very painful. But the trouble we found was by three o'clock, you were in such a state that your concentration level had gone. Yeah. Um, There's yeah. a point where your concentration drops off. Mm-hmm. And we could have had, well, we actually did have things happening around us on camera that we were taking no notice of whatsoever because we were so uncomfortable separated from it. Yeah. Yeah. So we decided to have some more visuals. And um, I made a schoolboy error. <laughs> I, I was, we were in the naffy. It was about two o'clock in the morning. 
we were dressed for the occasion this time. And I asked if there was anybody there. And there was a female voice that came back, said, I'm here. Four people heard it at the same time. Oh, wow. Because we all turned our head at the same time and we thought, someone else is up here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we all split up, went around the whole place. Now, when we get up there, we lock it off mm -hmm. so yeah. nobody can get in. It's a fair way from anywhere. Yeah. So is. you're not going to walk there on your own. No. Especially not at night. Especially not at night. It that is time in the middle morning. of nowhere. <laughs> it is. Well, yes, you know, you've been. So, okay, that was great. And then we started getting shots of lights, oh. pinpoints of lights. We got green flashes of lights outside, which we know they use green flares for come on in, mm -hmm. uh, red flares for do not land. Right. So we know that was the point. Uh, we also, it was so strange, we got people walking down the corridor of 55, the long the corridor. The long, yeah. Yeah. very, very long yeah. corridor. Yeah. Um, we heard people walking down there and we're waiting for them to come through the door. There's nobody there. And then I was sitting in what is now the museum. It was uh, um, it was the debriefing room for the pilots mm -hmm. during the war. It was just an empty room with a few uh, display units in. Mm -hmm. And I, I decided to sit there on my own and see what I could pick up. The rest of the crew had gone down the corridor. Mm. I knew all of them were down there. And we all wore black because the thing is, everybody said, why do you all wear black? There was a lot of glass. Uh, if you get a reflection back and it's not completely black yeah. and someone's wearing a white shirt or something, you know it's not one of your clothes. That's very clever. Mm -hmm. I like you your see? thinking. You yeah. see, that's why you do it, especially museums and things. Yeah, a lot of but, reflective surfaces. Yeah, yeah. And I spotted somebody sitting on, um, there's a um, whether it's a Lancaster or Wellington, uh, Robert would be able to tell you which engine it was, but there was a large aircraft engine in the corner of the room. Yeah. And I could see through the uh, glass that there was somebody sitting on it in a flying jacket and it got um, a hat on, an uh, RAF hat on. Oh, my goodness. I took a photograph of it, which I will pass to you. Excellent. And it was, um, it was just one of those things. Uh, it was there one minute and it had gone the next. And I asked the question again. Three people heard it. And through successive sessions... I got down to the last time I asked, and I was the only one who could hear it. Strange. How bizarre. Mm. Although it is something we've, we've come across before, where mm. only certain members of a group or a group of people might it have different experiences. It filters you out. Mm. Yeah, it does. It filters you out to the person who I believe they want to, to do with. something with. Yeah. And the reason this particular lady wanted me to do something was that she latched onto me for the next 18 months, whether I was at Twinwoods or not. Gosh, that's got to have been... Scary. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's got to have had a, yeah. a big effect on you. So this was during the time you were writing about yes. Twinwoods. Yeah, I was writing about it and um, it became... Would people say, oh, I'd love to um, be able to pick up on this, that and the other. <laughs> Sometimes you really don't. No. Mm -hmm. uh, because this was uh, a point where you lose control. Yeah. You yeah. lose control of whether you want it or not. And that was what I didn't like. But I made a conscious decision that I would write everything down and I would also, if I was getting anything and there was somebody near me, get them to record everything I was saying. I hadn't got a clue what was coming into my head. It was like having a conversation with somebody. Now, we're having a conversation now. Tomorrow, remember the conversation you're having today. So if you've had a conversation yesterday with somebody, mm -hmm. yeah. remember it and listen to it in your head. I know exactly, yeah, I know yeah? what you mean. That's yeah. what it was like. But the stuff that was coming into my head, I hadn't heard before. No. No idea. I was getting dates, numbers, all sorts of stuff. It got to a point, Robert clarified or, or didn't clarify but he he said that what i was getting was absolutely true he's got records from the ministry of defense because that's he has to get license from the ministry of defense to dig up aircraft ah, okay. and he had certain knowledge of 
events and people's records that who were you at Twinwoods. Couldn't possibly have known. No way can you get that stuff. And he was writing it down. He was just smiling. He said, This is spot on. He said, but you're giving me stuff I didn't even know now. Oh. Um, it got so intense that I knew this girl. So I've got a photograph of her now, but I knew I knew who she was before I even saw the photograph. Yeah. Um, I knew her eye colour, her hair, her name, her maiden name. Well, her mother's maiden name. I, I, I knew her family records. I knew every, absolutely everything about her. She turned into being like a sister. Yeah. I'd it be, was that intense. I was I'd be very say... interested to see that because just opposite from the Naffy, you've got the the shed with the vehicles that are mm. in the middle of it. Mm. As we were going round, um, I was just walking around doing some filming for the background of our YouTube version, and I saw what seemed to be a lady in a summer dress stood mm. looking into one of the cabinets with the uniforms in. Right. Um, and as I... Because you've got the, the vehicle trailer, vehicle yeah, trailer, yeah, yeah. and it was between the two vehicles, sort of over the top of the trailer, I could see this person stood there. Was it in front of the parachute? They had a parachute up there at one time. I don't remember sure seeing a parachute. Yeah. It's okay. the, You've got a display case, and I think it's got sort of um, dress uniform for yeah. an officer in the army. And I saw her as I was walking the other side of the vehicles. And then when I got to the end, which was only sort of 10 feet, it's not like anyone could have left by the time I got to the bottom. Mm. I turned and looked back up and there was nobody there. But I got, I got the impression of a sort of, you know, a 40 style summer dress and hair up in a sort of 30, 40 style. Mm. And I'd be interested to see, and I didn't get much detail. I will than, show you a photograph. Yeah, of it. acknowledging yeah. that there was yes. a woman there, yeah. that that sort of way. And I was intrigued to get sort of your impression on that as well. Yeah, that's where you were. Was the last time I spoke to her. Really, that that's building. Interesting. Yeah, and that was in two thousand and fifteen. We did an anniversary ghost hunt up there. But um, the the story that, uh, that um, I, I wrote in the book, I cut off at a certain point yeah. because family members still li- uh, live mm. and you don't want to drag up all the past. No, you? of course not. And it's one of those things where we had a park conclusion. I was working with a genealogist at the time and I was pointing the genealogist in a, in a direction that would help. The ghost was telling me what to say. Well, the spirit was telling me what to say. Yeah. I was then passing it on to the genealogist. Yeah. She managed to track down all the family from the three people that died. Wow. One was in Ireland, one was in Western Supermare, one was in London. And the Irish connection was the pilot. He'd been awarded the DFC posthumously awarded the DFC after he died at the age of 21. He was a fighter ace. Oh his brother, younger brother, he, he, I've got letters from the family. Yeah. How he, he used to write, the pilot who died, used to write to his brother, used to call him Brat. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be home for Christmas, Brat. But unfortunately he wasn't. But um, his brother, David, uh, wanted to let people know he was so proud of his brother's war record mm. that he wanted people to know how good he was and uh, how proud he was of his brother. So he said, oh, I was thinking of donating it to Duxford. Yeah. I said, well, it's, it's a good place. But he said he was based at Twinwoods and I don't know if they've got anything over there. <laughs> now, I could tell you a story about that. But um, he said, well, have they got a museum? I said, well, yes, they have got a museum. And... Um, if you would like to um, do something with the DFC, um, I'm sure they would be delighted to do the full story for you. And if you go up to Twinwoods now, you will see a case in the museum with a DFC and a story of a young pilot up there. And two weeks after it was donated, the brother David died. Oh, no. And as soon as the DFC was up there, the, the activity dropped. 
dramatically. Really? That's yeah. the opposite of what yeah. I thought would happen. Because yeah. I was going to say, so not only is, have you got the connection of that he was there in his lifetime, but then you've got a physical object as well belonging to this person. Yeah. Surely that might ramp things up, but it had the opposite no, effect. No, it quietened it down up until recently the activity levels have gone up again. Oh, why do you think that is? I'm not sure. I went over a few weeks ago, um, of the week after the, I did the opened up again for this season. And um, Lorraine, who works in the NAFI, um, said to me, she said, um, would you walk the corridor? Yeah. of 55, like you did before, and see where, she knew where, uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> see where the activity is now. And I just walked up, walked straight into it and turned the corner straight into it. And there it was again. All yeah. this activity was back. And it was like we were, we were up there before when it was there and it did the activities back up to those levels. See, I can understand... Um when the work was being done initially to do it all up yes that's something we hear a lot that um like renovations and building work that's how it actually started yes they actually uh, part of the reason they asked me to go up there was they they'd got this lady walking around uh they were using the large circular saw to, to cut big beams and they were really doing good renovations of that but it's very loud yeah mm-hmm. They were using ear defenders, mm-hmm. and they could ask, they could hear a woman asking if they could just stop for a minute so she could talk to them. Okay. <laughs> so they caught a glimpse of her on the doorway, but when they went out, well, you know yourself what it's like up there. There was nobody around. Yeah, there's well, nowhere exactly to hide. What you there's no, saw. Yeah. Very similar to what you saw. Mm. Yeah. And but, she is that woman. But, um, yeah, Twinwoods is a place that's... I would like to go back and do a full investigation up there if I ever get the chance. Mm -hmm. And if anybody wants to go up there and experience it for themselves, I mean, you know yourself, you've been there. I mean, it's such an atmospheric place. The the atmosphere hits you as soon as you as soon as you arrive, really. And it's I have it's not a negative thing, let me just say that. It's very tranquil, but busy. At the same time, mm. like there's an awful lot going on. Um, the, I didn't feel anything negative there at all, but there were some areas that I found quite overwhelming, and I had to step out. Mm. Um, the long hut. I don't know whether it, hut fifty five. Yeah, yeah, hut fifty five. They refer to um, that was very intense. Nothing mm. really happened so much in there, but it just the longer I was in there, the more the atmosphere built up. Mm. until it became a bit overwhelming and I had to sort of step outside. And from what the staff were saying, there's quite a lot of things that happen in there. Yes. Yeah, there are. There's a lot of people say that when you hear a ghost, a ghost is a pure recording of an event. Um, a spirit is a completely different subject. But a ghost is what they have up there. And it's a recording of an event that went on a long time ago. And it's replayed for you. Mm -hmm. A bit like the stone tape theory. Exactly. Stone tape theory, spot Mm -hmm. on. Yeah, exactly what it is. And it's annoying at Twin Woods (laughs) because you can be down in the museum and you will hear a conversation up the corridor and you will walk up the corridor to where you think the, the conversation was and you will hear it back. In the museum. Oh. It's like chasing rainbows. It is. Yeah. It's exactly that. It's exactly yeah. that. It's um I saw it on TV once when they said about you can hear a piano being played. Mm. You go down to the room where the piano is and it's not playing anymore, but it's in a different part of the house. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is. It's it, Twin Woods is like that. But um I very much got that impression in the mess hall um at the yeah, bar. The, area. the officer's mess. That yes. that just felt like like we were saying earlier, before we started recording, there are certain places that feel like there's a lot going on around you, you just can't see it. And that just felt like walking into a, a country pub or yeah. well, an, an, officer, an officer's bar. A, a it, busy bar. Yeah, it felt like there was a lot going on around you. you know, not nothing bad, just you know, people having a drink and having a laugh and letting yes. off some steam. But and I, I was just waiting to catch a snippet of music or hear the piano, there's a piano in the corner, and I was just fully expecting to hear 
some music playing, which actually, when I spoke to some of the volunteers later, that has happened. Yes, it has. Now, that's an interesting point. Um, I'll put a twist on this story in a minute, but it's that was an interesting point. If you put recording equipment at Twinwoods, yeah. you will get what was there in the past. I've got uh-huh. a recording for you. Um, it was made in the armory uh-huh. up at Twinwoods. It was the first vigil that we did. I got a, a just a tape, dictaphone, mm-hmm. voice activated, and there was a, a crashed engine in the old armory, and it's right next to 55. It's at the back of where yeah. those vehicles are. Yeah. That was the old armory. Oh, okay. So went in with Robert. He got the key, placed the recorder down. We came away. We did the rest of the vigil in 55. Nobody went back to the armory at all. In the morning when we went back, we've got two minutes of gunfire <gasps> Gun on the recording. Fire. On the recording. And you will hear it. There's also, also somebody singing. Oh my goodness! And oh, me the it was a it was a gentleman sort of doing a, a sort of a slight rhyming singing something in my place or something like that. But he's actually singing it, but the gunfire is so loud, oh. and we were you know how far away fifty five is. Yeah, mm. there was no way Robert had the key, and he let us back in afterwards. In fact, in actual fact, while we were there shortly after we pulled up, I remember commenting at how quiet it was. And how it is so far away from the road and other houses and any nearby towns, all that kind of town noise, road noise, you can't hear any of it. It is very still and quiet there. You don't mm. get noise pollution because it's just, in, like I said, it's in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, and you've got a wood around half of it to mm-hmm. sort of dampen the sound from that side. And then the other side is where the airfield used to be, and the other side of that, there's another wood. So it, it's pretty secluded. It's very it insulated is. from it outside is. noise. Yeah. And they've got an owl, a large white owl, that <laughs> flies between those trees oh. and up the pathway between the buildings at head height. Oh, that's give me <laughs> We've <a fright>. seen <laughs> that on so many occasions up there. It is so quiet and it doesn't. it's not bothered by people. Just out of interest, um, in the control tower, have you had any personal experiences in the control tower at Twinwood? Twinwood? And I ask because obviously that's the first place you visit when you um, go to the museum. And um, the very second <coughs> I walked across the, the staircase that goes up into the control room, it felt like the atmosphere was different on the staircase. Yes. Um, it felt thick and not negative, but felt thick and heavy. And I didn't even have to enter the staircase to feel it. It was just walking past it. Um, and then that first turn in the corridor towards the control room was very dense. Um, first time I was in the control tower, you go through the door, staircase to your left, mm-hmm. the first landing. Yeah. I sat on that first landing and I was on my own. There was nobody else with me there, we were in 55. And I got a camera and the door to the little kiosk yeah. opened <gasps> and closed again. As if someone had walked by in. Itself. And you could feel a cold draft walk past you as you were sitting on the staircase. And that was the first thing that happened to me. Oh, so I remember you saying at the time, yeah. and I didn't get any, I got nothing from mm. there. And it's odd that there are times that sometimes we both pick up the same thing and others. I, I got absolutely nothing on there, but I do remember you saying as I was going up the stairs that you, it felt strange. Well, yeah. oddly, my mum did as well. My my intrepid mum, who we love to take on our spooky adventures, she always says that she never picks anything up. She's completely oblivious to it. She, it's not that she doesn't believe, but she doesn't really want to know. <laughs> and she never normally gets any feeling, but she picked up that different atmosphere on the staircase as well, which is very <coughs> unusual. Yeah, so going back to my intrepid mum never having experiences, while we were at Twinwoods, we were in the control room tower, but downstairs in one of the rooms where they've got lots of photographs of all the airmen that were there. Yeah, these the uh, the ones. Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> okay. go on. Setting the scene. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and she suddenly jumped and turned around to me as if I'd done something to her, and said somebody just touched my hair and not only did she feel somebody touch her hair she thought it was me she thought I was messing with her 
But when she re- instinctively reached a hand up to her hair to see what, you know, if there was a cobweb or, I mean, there wasn't, there was, there's no low beams in there. There was nothing that, she was in the middle of the room. Nothing could mm. have grabbed her hair. Um, but as she reached her hand up, she felt something touch the back of her hand as she reached up to see what was in her hair yeah. as if she was brushing away somebody's hand. Yeah, you're not, she's, she's not the only person to have experienced that in oh, the control really? tower. Yeah. Yeah, the control tower is an, an unusual place. The owner, David uh, Wooding, said there was something that really did convince him that there was things going on up there. The control tower is, the electricity for the control tower is a huge breaker mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that is in the big building next to it, the shed in the middle of the courtyard. Yeah. There's a, there's a, there's a I, stage I mean, there yeah. and there's a big building behind it. So the breaker's in the there tower. and it's a double-handed job. Mm. Mm. Well, there were guests in the control tower and all the lights went out. Oh. So they, David had to go down to find out what was going on and this had been thrown. The switch, and main switch had been thrown to so the power. So can that happen on its own? No. That's no. got to be a That person, takes does it? double hands and it's, it's a barrel. Oh, yeah. goodness. Hmm. So something didn't want you up there? Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> didn't want also, up there. The, when you're upstairs, you go top of the landing and you turn your offices. Yeah. You've got the little kiosk bit in yeah. there with those mm. little cubby holes. Yeah. That's where the telephonist used to be. Mm. And when you're downstairs, a lot of people have reported uh, hearing typing. Oh, really? Going on upstairs. And when you're sitting where the bar piece is, uh, where the two ladies were standing, um, people report hearing conversations one-sided conversations yeah and we've had that um up there three times now that you've heard that we've heard have you managed to record it we tried to record one but i'm not sure if i've actually got it i've got years yeah of dvd stuff from so there. strange because you'd have thought if it was something like the stone tape theory where it's recording something that's happened it would get both sides of the conversation. Yeah, it's odd that it selectively that, does that just that isn't as in, That isn't as bad as when you think that you've got a telephonist talking to somebody. Oh, of course. Yes. Oh, oh well, yeah, of course. That one sided conversation, sense. exactly. Because it was telephony. Oh, I can't, I don't see, I don't know why I didn't make that connection. No, I didn't. It's strange because when you first go up there and you hear of these things or you even hear that happening yourself, mm. It just throws you because you, how, no. How does that work? You need to hear both, yeah. like you said. But if it's they're talking on a phone or they're doing something, it's one-sided. You would only get one yeah. side of the conversation. Oh, that's fascinating. How strange. Yeah. Well, um, the other thing that happened to me was in the long hut, I think you call it. Yeah, 55. Um, so it was the big room. I don't know whether it used to be, did you say debriefing room? Yes. Yeah, where the museum is. Now. Where the museum yeah. is. So you've got lots of display cabinets full of um, basically crashed engines. Yeah. Bits of plane. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some Each quite, one's got a story. I was going to say yeah. there's some amazing stories. <coughs> some of it's quite, um, well, it's very thought provoking because these are downed planes and people mm. died in them really. But basically, I was standing in front of um, one display case that had a bit of a, crash, a crashed plane, and I couldn't tell you which bit or what kind of plane. It was honest. the P38, and it was what the super turbocharger. I remember looking at it in the time and thinking, I thought superchargers and turbochargers were completely different things. But Fitz is an aviation <laughs> nerd. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it, it was a fork-tailed devil, the P38 Lightning Model J, <laughs> if you're really that interested. <laughs> But, but for my purposes, it's a bit of pl- crashed plane, mm. which I can't seem to get out. Um, you need to talk to Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should learn to unite. <laughs> so I was just standing in front of this display case, and I obviously I was I did have some information about what it was, so it could have been my subconscious feeding into my experience. Mm. If you know what I mean? I was reading a story about a plane that had crashed, but I smelt burning. And my mum smelled it as well, because I actually called her over and said, can you smell something? And we were hunting around to see if there was, um, I don't know, like a, a diffuser unit, like an air con mm. unit or anything like that that could have been producing the smell of burning. And we couldn't find anything. You had a look as well, didn't you? Yeah. I when didn't... I mentioned it. Where was... were you standing when you smelled that? 
basically, if you go through the door from outside, um, and basically the room is mainly to your right. Once you go through the door, it was just this directly across to your left. I wonder if he's moved it. And then you've got it sort of alongside where the door is that goes down the long corridor. With... Yeah. Um, on our investigation we did 2015, we took along a medium that I trust and have worked with for a long time. And we, I forgot the word they used for it, touching an object and picking up mm -hmm. on things. And we asked people to do this. There's one particular engine, large engine, mm. in that museum that makes people think of burning. Oh, really? Yeah. Now, he may have moved it to where you were. It comes from a, a plane that went in, shot down. I think it was coming back from Coventry to, to land back home and shot down by a fighter. The whole crew died horribly mm. in flames. And that engine, when people go near it or touch it, mm -hmm. gives the sense of burning. Oh, well, that's interesting. And if it you ask admit, Robert next time you're up there, he'll show you which one it is. Well, we'll, we'll definitely go back. We know mm. that already. So we will de we'll have to ask. If you ask him, right, which one it is, touch it. Yeah. See what happens. Oh, so, well, before we finish and wrap up then, for anybody visiting Twinwood, and we would highly recommend oh, yes. if you can visit Twinwood, do it. I know we're going to be going back. It's the sort of place that once you've been, it sort of calls to you. Mm -hmm. And that was very obvious from the volunteers and staff there. They obviously felt like it was almost a part of them at this mm. stage. What advice would you give to people going to Twinwood? Um, I would say forget the things that you've heard about Glen Miller. Mm -hmm. Forget that side of it. Go up to Twinwoods and with an open mind and experience the atmosphere, meet the people who are dedicated up there, listen to their stories, but make your own mind up. That's the thing. Don't go with preconceived ideas. Go there and allow the place to work on you. That, 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 is, that is absolute gold. It really is. And once you've gone up there once, you want to go back. I think that is exactly how me and Fitz both yeah. feel about the place. <laughs> Thankfully, that is how we experienced Twinwood. We did go without doing any research, actually, which paid off dividends, I think. Um, so that is golden advice as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so thank you so much for speaking to us today. It's been fascinating. Um, we will put all the links of how to get your books in the show notes yes. on the website. Ghost the Detective page. 1 to 6 with 7 on the way. 7 on the way. Uh, Highly we'll, recommended. We'll put links to those in the show description so you can uh, pick up a copy and we, we highly recommend it. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed it. Us too. Thank you. Thank you so much to Adrian for taking the time, the long time, <laughs> to speak to us and tell us all about his experiences. We really do appreciate it. And please do check out Adrian's series of ghost detective books. They're all amazing. But if you specifically want to read all about Twinwoods, then check out Ghost Detective 2, in which he writes in detail about his experiences there. We are proud owners of a signed copy now. Thank you, Adrian. You can find the Ghost Detective books on Adrian's website, at www.ghost-detective.com. We'll put that link in our show notes, or, of course, you can find the books on Amazon too. If you pop over to his website, you can actually listen to some more interviews with Adrian and some of the stories from his books on his radio and podcast page. And if you're local, you can find details of events he'll be appearing at this year. I'm afraid that's all that there is for this episode. We hope you enjoyed hearing about our experiences at Twinwood. Thank you again to Andrew, Kirsty, and Erin for sharing their stories and to Adrian for coming on the show. If you'd like to share your paranormal story, please get in touch through our website and we hope you'll join us again next time. Evening, peace, and 